Thank you. Um, so, uh, like Sarah said, I'm faculty here in the Department of Anthropology. Um, if you don't know much about me, uh, I got here about two years ago, so this is my fourth semester here at the University of Iowa, so I'm settling in quite nicely. Um, it's a nice place to live. Um, so, uh, like Sarah said, I'm a molecular anthropologist, so I'm a biological anthropologist, but more specifically, I'm a primate molecular ecologist. That's uh, how I would define myself. So what that means is I use uh, genetics or molecular methods to investigate ecological questions um, involving wild primate populations. Um, so this involves a combination of field work and lab work. Uh, so I've been, most of my field work has been in Africa. So I've been in and out of Africa uh, for the past five years. And uh, a lot of my work also involves endangered species. So, I work a lot in conservation genetics, or what is known as conservation genetics, so using genetics to help de designate conservation priorities and help inform conservation uh, decisions. Um, so today's, talks, today's talk is a little bit different than what I'm used to doing. Uh, usually I give a hev heavy science, scientific talk and then sprinkle a little bit of field work in. But today, because of the kind of Explorers Club theme uh, or Explorers lectures, uh, Lecture theme, and because I think the field work is more interesting, I'm going to try to uh, integrate more field work into it and then sprinkle in the science. Uh, I assume people are interested in the science as well, and uh, so it just doesn't look like I'm following monkeys around Africa. Um, so hopefully, uh, if, if, if that description of conservation genetics isn't ex exactly clear, hopefully after this talk um, it will be a little bit more self-explanatory. This is a picture I took in Tanzania last summer uh, in the Adzungwa Mountains, so I'll talk a little about the Adzungwas uh, later on, but this is um, the Sanjay mangabe, which is an endangered species there, uh, only found in that part of Africa. As many of you know, sustainability is a growing trend or awareness of sustainability. Uh, hopefully it's not just a fad um, and it's here to stay. Uh, but there's a growing awareness of how humans are impacting our environment. So what I want to talk about today is how humans are affecting our closest relatives, the non-human primates. So this is uh, just an example of primate diversity that you see across the world. Uh, you have your lemurs. Uh, in Madagascar, uh, you know, you have these tarsiers in Southeast Asia, lorises in South Asia, you have various New World monkeys, spider monkeys, uh, ukaris, uh, this mustache tamarind in the New World, uh, this is a red cap mangabe from Africa, uh, these gibbons from Southeast Asia, and of course you have um, our very closest relatives, the great apes, uh, orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees. So just an idea of uh, the type of diversity that you see uh, among our closest relatives. So um, primates are distributed across uh, modern, uh, across um, the tropical regions, so the tropical rainforests uh, of the world. Uh, this, that's their kind of evolutionary niche. That's where they first evolved, and that's where you find their greatest diversity. So when you're talking about what human activities are impacting primates, you're talking about what human activities are happening in the tropics that are affecting these animals. Uh, one of them that has gained a lot of attention is deforestation. So habitat alteration, whether it's um, cutting down forests for uh, cultivation or agriculture, or uh, harvesting resources such as fuel wood, or um, commercial logging for market profit. Uh, a lot of attention has been paid uh, to this type of activity and is widely considered to be the, um, the biggest long-term threat to, uh, to primates in the wild. Uh, if you cut down their homes, uh, they don't have places to live. Um, so some of the forest loss that has occurred in the past 50 or 100 years is pretty astounding. So these are maps of Sumatra over here and Borneo. Uh, so the amount of forest coverage that has been lost. Uh, this is extended, uh, predicted out to tw um, 
2020. This is where orangutans live. So they're endemic to these islands. You have the Sumatran orangutan and the Bornean orangutan. And we will most likely see, or almost definitely see, the Sumatran orangutan go extinct within our lifetime. Uh, it's now restricted to uh, a small forest fragment in the very northeastern part of Sumatra. So this forest, um, cutting down these forests has had a, a devastating effect on some uh, of these primate populations. That's not just total net forest loss, but it's also forest fragmentation. So you can have a landscape, and if you fragment it into various uh, small subpopulations or small, um, small forest fragments that create a, a subpopulations, uh, sometimes these populations um, can't exchange gene flows from others, one another, so animals can't cross these uh, matrix areas that separate the fragments. So this will limit animals from finding mates, limit, limit animals from uh, finding resources, uh, and so forth. So uh, you can also have things like reduction in genetic diversity in these fragments, uh, which increases the effects of genetic drift, uh, which you, know, you can increase the uh, instance of inbreeding, uh, decrease the adaptive potential of these animals for uh, to change when the environment changes. So uh, habitat fragmentation, not just habitat loss, plays a large role as well. So another uh, activity that is not as well known as deforestation is hunting. Um, so why do humans hunt in these areas? Uh, why do they hunt primates? Um, or why do they hunt animals in these tropical rainforests? For a variety of reasons, uh, for skins and organs, for either uh, ceremonial or medicinal purposes. Uh, if you kill, um, or th sometimes they will hunt crop raiders, so uh, animals or primates that are uh, destroying their commercial products. Uh, there's the pet trade as well, uh, hunting to capture animals to sell into the pet trade. And then also hunting for food as a protein resource. And that's uh, what I want to give a little bit more attention to. Um, because it's one of the, it's the other major threat that primates face. Um, while I said the long-term the, the long threat to primates may be deforestation, uh, hunting in many areas such as West Central Africa, uh, parts of Asia, and parts of uh, the Americas um, poses a more immediate threat to primates. So basically, uh, you, humans can hunt out a primate population before uh, the, the environment, before the forests are cut down. And you have good examples of this. For example, in Ghana, uh, you have this thing called the empty forest syndrome, where you have these large, pristine, lush, lush forests that are devoid of large mammals, including primates, because they've just all been hunted out. So sorry for these gruesome images, but um, this is the reality of, of what's going on. Uh, many people believe, or many people might, people might think this is really um, unusual or maybe gross to be eating uh, primates like monkeys and gorillas and chimpanzees. Uh, but you can go to these areas, and you can go to restaurants, and you can order bushmeat off menus. Uh, so bushmeat is this wild meat that's coming out of the forest. So you, often uh, you find primate meat in these restaurants. But what I want to emphasize is that um, this is just a cultural difference. Uh, there, there's nothing unusual about this. Uh, just like you may go to the supermarket, and you may buy locally grown or produced meat. Uh, as for a protein resource, you might go and buy uh, you know, a mana beef from the grocery store or Iowa pork, uh, they're doing the same thing. They're going to these markets and they're buying uh, the local protein resource that's coming out of um, forests that are nearby. I want to emphasize that a lot of this hunting is not subsistence hunting, so it's not just hunting for uh, an, an individual's family or for local trade within a village or between um, close villages. Uh, this is market hunting, so it's highly commercialized. Um, Bushmeat crosses international boundaries. Uh, there are high-profile cases, uh, for example, in New York City of bushmeat coming in uh, and being confiscated by customs. Um, it's not being done by traditional methods, necessarily, uh, not necessarily by bows or snares. There's a person using a bow, a person setting up a snare. Uh, shotgun hunting and using uh, machine guns like AK-47s um, to wipe out these populations is not that uncommon. So why are primates so susceptible to extinction? Uh, humans obviously have an impact on all of the animals in these forests that primates share. Um, so why are primates uh, especially uh, susceptible to going extinct or suscept especially susceptible to these threats? Um, for one, they have large body size. So for a hunter, something with large body size is desirable. Uh, it's more bang for your buck if you kill something with large body size, more meat to sell. Along with large body size comes a slow reproductive rate. So they reproduce uh, more slowly. Uh, they are often incapable of rebounding from population crashes. Um, and also, they're sensitive to habitat disturbance. So 
They often rely on specific food items. If that food item ten is a commercially valuable item, uh, some kind of timber, uh, then they're in competition with humans for those resources. Uh, if it is a food item that is widely dispersed and the landscape is fragmented, they may not be able to collect enough of the resources to survive. So uh, these, are many, these are some of the reasons why primates are in, in, in danger of going extinct um, from this human activity that I've been talking about. How do we go about uh, protecting or, or saving or conserving these primates? Uh, before you go on the ground and start trying to do conservation, you need to have an idea of what you're conserving and how to do it. Um, in other words, you have to designate conservation priorities. This is just the kind of cold, hard facts of it. We don't have enough money to save everything. If we had unlimited funds, sure, we could save everything, but uh, that's just not possible. So we have to make tough choices as far as uh, what is most important to protect, what is most endangered. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, one way is through the IUCN red list. So the IUCN is very heavily involved in designating conservation priorities. Every year they come out with this red list that assesses the threat levels to all the plants and animals in the world. So these categories such as uh, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, these are all uh, categories that are developed by the IUCN red list. The next thing you might do to designate conservation priorities is to create an action plan. So this is also done uh, by the IUCN. So this takes a certain group that you're looking at, in this case it's African primates, and lists the priorities that need to be uh, accomplished for, um, for conservation to happen. So whether it's looking at certain species or looking at certain landscapes, uh, action plans typically designate what need, needs to be done as far as conservation or what research needs to be done in order to better inform conservation strategies. So this is, a, this is a pretty large undertaking when, for large groups of animals, or, uh, such as African primates, to survey all of African primates and designate priorities. So the last one, this is the last one that was done in 1996. And the, the monkey on here is a red colobus monkey. Uh, it's not a chimpanzee or a gorilla. You often hear about chimps and gorillas when you're talking about endangered African primates. But it's widely known or widely accepted that red colobus monkeys are one of the, if not the most endangered group of primates in Africa, and certainly one of the most endangered primate groups in the world. So this is an idea of what red colobus monkeys look like, the variation that you see across Africa uh, in these monkeys. They do not exist in zoos. Uh, for whatever reason, we cannot keep them alive in captivity, so they're only found in the wild. And one of the problems with red colobus monkeys as far as conservation goes is we don't know where to start as far as, designating, as, far as these conservation priorities I'm talking about. Um, there are all these different populations. And we don't have a good idea of which ones are most distinct. If you're trying to preserve biodiversity, uh, you want to preserve genetic diversity, you want to preserve evolutionary history, you want to preserve evolutionary distinct lineages uh, in order to prevent the loss of, um, of evolutionary history. But we don't know which ones are most distinct. So uh, that's one of the problems. To give you an idea of the threat levels of these monkeys, uh, so these are different morphs, these numbers, uh, whether you want to call them species or subspecies, uh, that's up to you, but uh, numbers one and two are endangered. Number three is Miss Waldron's red colobus, which we think is extinct. So if it is extinct, that represents the uh, first primate extinction we've had uh, in, mo in the modern era since the early 1900s. Uh, four, number four is the Niger Delta red colobus, uh, just recently discovered in, in the 90s and already critically endangered. Number five and six, uh, endangered. Number seven is Bouvier's red colobus, probably extinct, hasn't been seen in decades. You have this whole Central African assemblage, uh, which we really don't know what's going on there. Uh, it's an area of civil unrest, we don't have a lot of data, probably under heavy hunting pressure. Number 15, endangered. Number 16, critically endangered. Number 17 and 18, endangered. So over half of these morphs, uh, these populations, um, are endangered or critically endangered. So how can you go about trying to designate conservation priorities? Well, you can use this, you can do that through genetics. You can sample all these different populations. Uh, you can look at their genetic diversity, look at which ones are most molecularly distinct. And then those are the ones that you might want to start focusing on if, you, um, if you're trying to do conservation, if you're trying to preserve the evolutionary history of this group. So this is what uh, I set out to do. Um, 
This is a pretty ambitious project as far as sampling goes because they range across equatorial Africa. So these are different localities that I had to sample from. Um, now, I couldn't do this all on my own. I had a lot of help from collaborators, people who sent me samples from different areas. But for some of these areas, I did have to travel to. So these are the places I've been to in the past five years. So um, this is uh, the Gambia over here, uh, Cameroon over here, uh, this island Bioko off the coast of Cameroon, which is part of Equatorial Guinea, Uganda and Kabale National Park, and uh, the Zungwa Mountain National Park in Tanzania. So I had to go to all these places and collect samples uh, non-invasively. Um, so if you're collecting samples from wild populations that are endangered, typically you have to do this non-invasively. So when I say I go around and collect non-invasive samples, that's kind of a nice way of saying I go around and follow monkeys and collect monkey poop. Uh, so here's me collecting a nice, fresh, steamy turd. Uh, and I put these in these uh, little preservative um, or in these little plastic containers that are uh, sealed and then uh, they have pre with preservative in them. So this one, I typically get a lot of questions about my field work. Uh, one question I typically get is, can you identify or do different species, does, does the poop of different species look different? So I can say yes. Uh, you can identify um, the species that uh, these different um, fecal pellets come from. And the question I typically get is, what is your field work like? So, uh, that's what I want to spend the next few uh, parts of this, of this lecture talking about because it, it's very complicated. It depends on where I am. Uh, it depends what the infrastructure is present. It depends on uh, how the primates are behaving and what threats they face. For example, primates in hunted areas behave very differently than primates in uh, areas where they're not hunted. So I first want to talk about uh, the Gambia. So this is the first place uh, I visited in Africa in 2005. Uh, it's one of the smallest countries in Africa, if not the smallest country in Africa. Uh, and the major threat to primates here is habitat fragmentation. Uh, most of my work was done in a place called Ubuko Nature Reserve in the Gambia. Uh, so here's an idea of what the kind of wildlife diversity there is in Ubuko. Uh, aside from red calvus monkeys, you have African green monkeys. You have spotted hyenas. Uh, you have various antelope, like this bush buck, with these kind of very distinctive markings on its body. Uh, you have lots and lots of birds. So many of the tourists here are birders. If you're familiar at all with birding culture, there's people with checklists of birds that they travel around the word, world to see. And uh, you know, they see species, they check it off their list, and they move on. Uh, this is one of my favorites, actually. This is a, an umbrella bird um, known for its appearance there. So it basically uses its wings to cover its head. And then uh, it shields the sun from hitting the water. And it looks for fish um, to eat. So it's a very interesting bird there. This is a very touristy area, so uh, you have a lot of people coming here to see birds, a lot of people coming here to see, um, see monkeys. There are beaches nearby as well. This is off the coast of West Africa. So this, is, this was kind of an ideal situation for me because this was my first time in Africa. Most people, most anthropologists who do field work, the first time they go to the field, they're either with someone, uh, their advisor, or uh, with a research group. But for whatever reason, I was under circumstances where I ended up going to the field for the first time by myself uh, in um, trying to study these monkeys, trying to collect feces from these monkeys, these endangered monkeys that no one has ever done before. Uh, some people thought it wasn't even possible. So it was probably very good that I was in this very controlled environment um, that had a lot of kind of tourist infrastructure. So it took me a while to figure out how to collect these samples, because like I said, no one had ever done it before. Uh, I spent a few days just trying to follow the monkeys every day, but they kept losing me in dense vegetation. Uh, there were some nights where I would follow them to their sleeping trees. And then it would get dark, and I'd be lost in the forest by myself. And it was nighttime, and I was freaking out because I didn't know if I'd get if I'd ever make it out. Uh, yeah, so yeah, being lost in a forest in Africa at night by yourself is not—it's uh, kind of a scary um, experience, especially when there are like all these local rumors that the forests are haunted. And anyway, so um, after a week of trying these different strategies of collecting uh, of collecting samples with no success, uh, I finally decided to wake up as early as possible and try to find them first thing in the morning. Uh, so wake up at 5 a.m., uh, try to find them in their sleeping trees. And that worked out really well. Because um, in the morning when they wake up, they all go to the bathroom. So the first time I collected a sample was actually one that hit me. So my, my days, uh, so once I established a system, I would wake up uh, first thing in the morning around 5 a.m. 
uh, you know, I'd eat, then I'd go out, and, go out and try to find them. I'd collect the samples. I'd spend the rest of the day trying to follow other troops. Um, and that, then at night, I would follow a troop to its sleeping tree, put it to bed, so that the next morning I would know uh, where to find that group. And I'd just kind of do that over and over again, day after day. Um, then, so I, I was typically spending between 12 and 14 hours in the forest at a time. Uh, then I'd get home, I'd uh, wash up, I'd eat, then kind of pass out from exhaustion. Um, as far as where home is, it just kind of depended on the different areas. Like I said, this is a very touristy area that I was working, so there were these kind of tourist hostels that were across the street from the nature reserve that I was able to use. So this is uh, the courtyard in the, in the hostel, this is uh, my room, this is a dog that really hated me, uh, and this is the owner, Mohammed, with uh, his brother, Kabir. Um, so like I said, this was, a, this was a very kind of cushy situation. It was probably a good thing because this is my first time doing this work um, in Africa. Uh, and this area also had occasional electricity, running water. Uh, so um, those were nice amenities to have. A different place in, in the Gambia I went to uh, was a little bit more remote. Uh, it was about a 10-hour drive inland uh, from the Buko Nature, Res Nature Reserve. It wasn't exactly that far from the Buko Nature Reserve, but uh, the roads are so bad, it just takes 10 hours to get there. Um, but this is a really remote area. So again, I was near a forest, but I had to stay in the village. So uh, this is the hut that I stayed in. I had the nicest hut in the village. Uh, this is what one of the typical huts looks like. Um, they saved the nicest ones for white people. So in Africa, I'm technically white. Um, this is actually a hut that is typically used by a Peace Corps volunteer. So uh, this is where I was staying. This is my room. But uh, you know, the base changed, but, uh, and, and the circumstances there, there was no running water, no electricity. Uh, I had to get my water from a well uh, for drinking water, for bathing water. Um, but the work was essentially the same. I still had to go to the forest, uh, spend time in there, um, find monkeys in the morning, find them at night before they went to bed, and so forth. So another place I've been is Corp National Park in Cameroon, also a very different experience from uh, what I just described in the Gambia. Uh, this is in West Central Africa, so this is one of the wettest places in Africa, and it has a very diverse primate community. Um, the ecology there, uh, this is your very kind of classic old growth um, rainforest, uh, kind of pristine, very lush. Uh, and the main threat here is hunting. So you have these various Gwenins, uh, these Trichopithecus monkeys, uh, you have chimps there, you have these forest baboons uh, that are very endangered called drills. And then you have this Prusa's red colobus monkey, which is what I was collecting from. So here's the entrance to the park. So you have this uh, large bridge that looks like something out of an Indiana Jones movie uh, that looks very precarious, and it kind of is, but I guess it did the job. Um, so the conditions here were very different. Uh, again, this is a very remote area. Uh, I did not have a kind of tourist hostel or a village to stay in. So I had to live in the forest for one to two weeks at a time. Um, so this meant taking in a team of people, um, usually a team of porters to carry all the equipment and food, uh, a camp manager, a cook, and a field guide. Uh, so here you have uh, um, the, my porters crossing the bridge. I don't know if you can tell what's going on there, but uh, this one porter has a 25 to 35 pound bag on his back, and another one uh, on his head. Um, he's probably wearing flip flops or something. Uh, it's about a six or eight hour hike to the base camp um, over pretty rough terrain, and uh, my porters still beat me to the camp. This is the base camp I used. Uh, this is kind of a tourist camp that's built in the, in the forest. It's actually not there anymore. It was destroyed this past year. Uh, you can ask me about that some other time. It's kind of a long story. Um, and then from here, I would take uh, trips, six to eight hour hikes, uh, and set up these satellite camps to move around the forest to try to find these monkeys. Uh, here's the team of uh, field workers that I hired from a local village. Uh, that was that, uh, they were working with me. Uh, so like I said, this is one of the wettest places in Africa. Uh, it was very humid. Um, so the conditions were very different than what I'd ex experienced before. Uh, again, you'd wake, I'd wake up around 5 a.m. I'd put on a wet, moldy t-shirt because nothing ever dried. Uh, I'd try to get out of camp by 6 a.m. to try to find the monkeys uh, when they first woke up. Uh, also, I'd try to get out by 6 a.m. because that's when the bees start to swarm the camp. So I did not want to be around that. Uh, and then I'd come back, I'd conveniently arrange my, my arrival back in the camp around 6 p.m. because that's when the bees leave. Um, 
people often ask me, what do I eat in the forest? Uh, so I was looking for pictures of, of food that I eat in the forest. Um, and this is the only one I could find. And this is not a typical example of what, is, what I would eat in the forest. This is actually the only picture I have because it was an exceptional meal. What you're seeing here is rice uh, with plantains. This is a smoked piece of uh, cow meat, a smoked piece of beef. And then the sauce over here is um, some kind of ground nut or peanut um, sauce with palm oil. Uh, so this is a, an actually very exceptional, very good meal that is very atypical of what I was eating in the forest. This one night, we just happened to have this. Uh, more typical was something like um, rice and beans and sardines, or spaghetti and sardines, or sardine stew, or sardines and crackers. Uh, so lots and lots of sardines. If you don't like sardines, you can maybe replace that with a cheap version of Spam. Sometimes the Spam was mixed with the sardines. Um, also, uh, this is what we would have for dinner, but you would also have the same thing the next morning for breakfast. So at 5 a.m., you'd wake up and have a giant plate of spaghetti and sardines to put down. And you had to put it down because uh, you probably wouldn't eat again for a while. For, um, you, you would probably bring some small snacks uh, out while you're walking around the forest, but you wouldn't eat, have another full meal again for another 12 hours. So um, yeah, putting down a giant plate of, of, of spaghetti and sardines at 5, 5 a.m. is um, an acquired ability, let's say. So getting around camera rooms uh, was also an interesting experience. Uh, you would probably get around in one of these types of vehicles, maybe this uh, bus here. Uh, my favorite was the, the bush taxi. So this is a bush taxi that I had hired. Uh, so this is all my field equipment crammed into the trunk of this beat up probably 1982 or two-door Toyota Corolla or whatever it is. Um, so to give you an idea of what it's like traveling around in a bush taxi, uh, so if, if you picture yourself in your car and try to picture you know, a comfortable number of people that would fit in your car. Um, now this is a two-door, like I said, you know, beat up Corolla or something like that. Uh, and you'd be crammed in this car with seven other people. So eight people in this car. Uh, you'd have maybe four people in the back, uh, four people in the front. So two people in the driver's seat, two people in the passenger seat. Uh, for, like I said, you know, a four, six, eight hour drive uh, on these treacherous roads. So this is kind of what travel in Cameroon is like. Um, I often get questions like, uh, you know, you must have had some crazy near-death experiences while you're in Africa in the field. Well, yeah, every time I stepped in the car, it was pretty much a near-death experience. Um, so uh, very close to Corp National Park is this island, Bioko, part of Equatorial Guinea. Um, same faunal community uh, that you find in Corp. And this is, was actually my most recent trip to Africa, uh, just this past winter break. This is where I was. Uh, and again, hunting is the biggest threat here. Um, the field work was very similar to Corp. I had to live in the forest for a couple weeks, uh, for a couple weeks uh, in tents. But some of the logistics were different. Um, for one, it's an island. So uh, there was about a three-hour boat ride to the southern part of the island where the monkeys are most abundant. Uh, I was part of an expedition, so there are about 30 people on this expedition, so carrying equipment and food and toilet paper and whatever for 30 people uh, for two weeks in the forest. Uh, you know, it's just a lot of stuff. So this is uh, the pile of equipment that was on the boat. These are some dolphins that uh, we often saw playing in the wake of the boat. Now this is, this is a remote area, so there was no dock for this boat, so we had to unload the boat in, uh, with these smaller boats to take to the shore. Um, so it took almost a whole day to unload the boat and set up the camp. Uh, it wasn't too bad. Uh, they do this expedition every year, so if you're interested in, in, in going here, just, you know, you can talk to me and, um, and we can look into arranging that. But, uh, you know, there's some years where the, the tide is really rough and, you know, some of these boats would capsize and people would be in the water and they'd lose their equipment. And so uh, that did not happen to me, th thankfully. Um, so here's the base camp here on the beach uh, with a bunch of tents. Like I said, it was a pretty large operation. Uh, we did have generators, so we uh, had electricity, so we could um, use our laptops, charge our cameras, um, use GIS equipment. So the main camp I was at, though, was uh, a, a bit more remote, about a seven-hour hike from that base camp. Basically, um, this camp is in a volcanic crater, so Bioko is a volcanic island, uh, and it would be a seven-hour hike up the mountain, up the volcano, and then uh, down into the crater. So what you're seeing here is a view from inside the crater. If you were to pan 360, 360 degrees around, uh, you would see uh, the crater walls all around you. So this is an area where the monkeys were most abundant. Uh, the volcano is inactive, at least that's what I've been told. So this is a picture of me organizing my samples at night. Uh, this is Jake Owen, a grad student from Drexel University who's studying uh, primate feeding ecology. 
on the island. Uh, he's picking up a nice little present that a primate has freshly left him. We got some really good pictures of the primates on this last trip. Uh, some of the best pictures that exist for some of these species. National Geographic uh, came to Bioko a couple years ago and did a full spread on the Bioko monkeys, and um, they still didn't get pictures that were nice, as nice as some of these. This is probably the best picture we have in existence for Prusa's monkey, um, and this is a red-eared monkey. So these are uh, both very endangered species that only exist in this part of Africa. The other two places I've been, I, I want to talk about together because they're similar experiences, but very different than what I've been talking about. Uh, one is, uh, I mentioned earlier, Kabali National Park in Uganda, and the other is the Udzungwa Mountains in Tanzania. And the reason why these are similar uh, and different from the other experiences is because uh, there are biological field stations there uh, where people have been conducting long-term research. Uh, in some cases, for example, at Kabale, uh, there have been decades and decades of research being conducted um, on the primates there. So I want to focus on the Udzungwa Mountains, though, because that was my, uh, my more recent trip. I was in Kabale in 2006. Udzungwa, uh, I was in the Udzungwa's last summer in 2009. So these are the primates that you find in the Udzungwa Mountains. It's a very diverse community. Um, you have the Rungwasibus kapunji, this recently described uh, uh, monkey that's critically endangered. Uh, you have the Sanjay mangabe and the Dzungwa red colobus, both of which are only found in this area and both of which are endangered. Uh, and you have these other um, primates as well. So the main problem in the Dzungwa Mountains uh, is habitat fragmentation. So you have these large forest blocks that are separated. Um, it's hard to tell with the scale of this map, but these forest blocks are very large and, and the distance between them is very large as well. So primates cannot cross um, these areas um, where, the, where the fragments are separated. And these fragments are maintained by human activity. So, um, so over the course of time, it's been humans that have been uh, fragmenting these forests. So this is the research station uh, where I was based. So you can see um, there's a satellite here. So you have satellite uh, for internet. Uh, there's running water, there's electricity. Um, food options aren't so great. There's not a lot of protein there, so hard boiled eggs. Uh, and rice and beans just about every day um, for every meal for about three weeks. Got pretty old, um, but it is what it is. This is the house I stayed at. Uh, and these are student dormitories that are being constructed. They should be done by now. Uh, they're supposed to be done by December. So uh, they're really building up their infrastructure for research and education here. So hopefully, uh, not this summer, but maybe summer 2011, I'll be able to teach a field course here in primate conservation biology. Uh, if you want to take that, whether you're a student here or not, um, we can talk about that. This is the view of the forest uh, from the field station. So this is a mountain forest, um, which is really interesting. Uh, as you go up the mountain, the tree species composition really changes. So that allows for a change in the animal species as well. Uh, so you have, different, um, you have different levels of abundance of these primate species uh, at the base of the mountain than, uh, than what you see at the top of the mountain. So uh, a lot of interesting gradients going on. Um, that people can study. So that's the view from the field station. So if you go to the, if you go to the top of the mountain, this is the view from the, opposite, um, from the opposite side. So here's the field station there. Uh, so there's the field station there, the three houses. Uh, the student dormitories are somewhere over here. So give you an idea of um, the two opposite views. This is Makoro, who was my field assistant there. Uh, Makoro was very good at finding primates and identifying their feces, which was good because uh, this was my first time there, so I was not really familiar with the primate species there and what their uh, feces looked like. So uh, Makoro greatly helped um, my research. Would not be able to collect as many samples as I did without him. And here are a couple of the pictures that we have uh, that were taken this past trip. Uh, here's the Udzungwa red colobus and the Sanjay mangabe. Again, both endangered and only found in, in the Udzungwa mountains. So these are, again, uh, some of the best pictures I think we have um, of these species now. So like I was saying, uh, I couldn't visit all these places on my own. You know, the red, the red stars are places I've been, um, but the, the black stars are places where people gave me samples. Um, they were collecting, they were doing research there. They happened to collect samples. They sent them to me. Uh, I also utilized field and museum specimens. So. Basically, anything I could squeeze DNA out of, I would use. Um, a lot of these populations are in areas of civil unrest, so it's impossible to collect from them. Uh, or the populations are so endangered, uh, you just don't see them anymore, so you can't collect from them. So from, from, from populations like that, I had to use, uh, I had to resort to uh, these alternative methods for DNA collection. Using all those uh, samples, uh, I constructed this phylogenetic tree using mitochondrial DNA, uh, if, if you're interested in that. Uh, that information. Um, 
And this is the tree that comes out. Uh, from these data, you can infer that the red colobus radiation split uh, or began around 3 million years ago, which was much further back in time than previously thought. Some previous estimates was, were just a few hundred thousand years ago that this radiation started. So it seems like uh, it's a much deeper radiation than previously thought, and there's a lot more genetic diversity uh, present than previously thought. Um, you have seven different, uh, what I would call phylo groups here, uh, that represent divergent lineages. And if you map, if you map these on the red colobus distribution, this is uh, the result that you get. So uh, just a few notes here. Uh, I grouped phylo groups D and E together because there were members from the same population that fell uh, into uh, these two groups. Um, so they're, even though they're genetically divergent, uh, it seems that um, maybe there are genetically divergent lineages that are now hybridized. Uh, it, pr it probably has something to do with the complex history of the, um, the Central African rainforest, which we don't know a whole lot about. Uh, so those two are grouped together. Uh, Bouvier's red colobus over here, like I said, is probably extinct. Uh, there are only maybe 15 specimens in the world in museums uh, that are scattered across the world. Uh, so I was not able to sample that. Um, we don't really know what's going on with that animal. Um, no one really wants to go look for it because it exists in the largest swamp in Africa. Um, my graduate advisor tried to get me to go, but I said, no way. Um, so there's a couple of notes. So what, what you should see here, what, what, is, what is interesting is you have a lot of diversity. You have these four different phylo groups in West Africa. So previously, most of the conservation efforts for these red colobus monkeys were being focused on East Africa because they thought that's where the greatest diversity was. Uh, but it turns out uh, there's a lot of diversity in West Africa as well. One of these phylo groups, uh, B over here, belongs to Miss Waldron's red colobus. So that is uh, the species that I said, or the, um, the morph that I said was probably extinct. So it seems we've already lost a large part of evolutionary history in this group, a large part of their biodiversity. Um, so from this, what I would say is, uh, you know, conservation priorities have to be shifted so that we're taking account these diverse lineages in West Africa as well. Uh, I'm not saying abandon uh, what's going on in East Africa, but we really have to shift things so that we're paying attention to these populations, especially these really kind of restricted, um, uh, uh, these populations are really restricted in geographic range and represent these uh, lineages. So G, C, and F, I would say, uh, are in particular need of conservation attention. So in conclusion, uh, the initial diversification of red colobus monkeys occurred much earlier than previously thought. Um, so they're much more diverse than previously thought. They're much, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more evolutionary distinct lineages in there. So there are numerous distinct red colobus molecular lineages that are present. And red colobus monkey conservation priorities should be assigned to distinct evolution lineages with fragmented distributions, especially these one, these that are found uh, in West Africa. So by doing that, we will put ourselves in the best position to prevent a loss of biodiversity within this group. So how does this affect um, conservation priorities or what actions have been done because of this work? Uh, every two years, IUCN, in, in conjunction with Conservation International, um, puts out the primates in peril. So this is the list of the 25 most endangered primate species, uh, or 25 most endangered primates in the world. So this work uh, that I just presented was instrumental in bringing the Niger Delta red colobus uh, on, onto this list. So that's this thing over here. Like I said, this was just discovered recently in the 90s. Uh, it, it itself represents a very distinct evolutionary lineage. Uh, it, it's in a really restricted geographic range. It's critically endangered. It's, an, it's in an area of civil unrest. The Niger Delta is where um, uh, there's a lot of oil production for Nigeria. So a lot of uh, civil unrest is there. A lot of people are getting kidnapped and so forth. So it's very hard to implement conservation uh, strategies there. But hopefully uh, this will this will draw attention to, um, uh, to the problems that are involved in, uh, in the existence of this animal. Um, and in general, uh, you know, hopefully this work will allow conservation biologists to reassess um, the strategies that they're employing to conserve red colobus monkeys and other primates as well, uh, so that uh, conservation action is more effective in preserving biodiversity. Depends where, but in general, it's really hard to explain genetics. Um, and it's really hard to explain why I'm following around these monkeys and collecting their feces. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely absurd to them. 
Um, but in, in some of these areas, like in, in the Dzungwas, um, uh, the, the guides are very well trained. They work for the National Park, and um, they've had other researchers coming in doing this. So they're more familiar with it. In some of the other areas, not so much. Uh, they don't really uh, quite understand what exactly I'm doing or why I'm doing it. Um, I, I can kind of describe it to them, but uh, in very kind of vague terms. But uh, as far as the details, as far as the genetics, uh, it, that doesn't necessarily get through. It's certainly been going on since the 90s, probably. Um, and it's really picked up uh, ever since, I mean, the more the methodology gets, uh, um, gets affordable, the more it's being used. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it is a very kind of uh, growing field right now. Uh, but it's, it's, been, it's been used for at, at least the past 10 years or so. Um, but yeah, it's getting to be more and more common now. Especially uh, people who have, Done, uh, if you ever heard of barcoding, so people are trying to barcode. So if, if, you, have, um, if you have meat that's uh, crossing international boundaries or ivory or something, you can actually barcode it and uh, extract DNA and then to figure out exactly where it's coming from. So uh, a lot of like, law, enforce, law enforcement agencies are, have been looking into that as a way of tracking the movement of, um, of illegal substances or illegal wildlife trade. Well, now, nowadays there are these kind of handy kits that you can just buy, and uh, and yeah, you basically these kits have these reagents where um, you know the DNA gets lysed uh, with the fecal samples. You have to there's some extra steps to kind of remove any kind of inhibitors that might uh, prevent the amplification of DNA, uh, and then there are various kind of washes and buffers you put it through um, into this kind of filter tube uh, that kind of catches the DNA. So I'd like to thank uh, my funding agencies, Primate Conservation Inc., National Science Foundation, New York Consortium of Evolution and Primatology, uh, these large number of collaborators that um, provided me with samples. Uh, they, this work wouldn't have been possible without them. And then these institutions and people that helped me out in the field. And I'll just leave you with a picture of the Zungwa red colobus.